Happiness by Anton Chekhov A flock of sheep was spending the night on the broad steppe road that is called the Great Highway. Two shepherds were guarding it. One, a toothless old man of eighty, with a tremulous face, was lying on his stomach at the very edge of the road, leaning his elbows on the dusty leaves of a plantain. The other, a young fellow with thick black eyebrows and no mustache, dressed in the coarse canvas of which cheap sacks are made, was lying on his back, with his arms under his head, looking upwards at the sky, where the stars were slumbering and the Milky Way lay stretched exactly above his face. The shepherds were not alone. A couple of yards from them, in the dusk that shrouded the road, a horse made a patch of darkness, and beside it, leaning against the saddle, stood a man in high boots and a short, full-skirted jacket, who looked like an overseer on some big estate. Judging from his upright and motionless figure, from his manners and his behavior to the shepherds and to his horse, he was a serious, reasonable man who knew his own value. Even in the darkness, signs could be detected in him of military carriage and of the majestical, condescending expression gained by frequent intercourse with the gentry and their stewards. The sheep were asleep. Against the gray background of the dawn, already beginning to cover the eastern part of the sky, the silhouettes of sheep that were not asleep could be seen here and there. They stood with dropping, drooping heads, thinking. Their thoughts, tedious and oppressive, called forth by images of nothing but the broad step and the sky, the days and nights probably weighed upon themselves, crushing them into apathy. And standing there as though rooted to the earth, they noticed neither the presence of a stranger nor the uneasiness of the dogs. The drowsy, stagnant air was full of the mon monotonous noise inseparable from a summer night on the steppes. The grasshoppers chirruped incessantly, the quails called, and the young nightingales trilled languidly half a mile away in a ravine where a stream flowed and willows grew. The overseer had halted to ask the shepherds for a light for his pipe. He lighted it in silence and smoked the whole pipe, then, still without uttering a word, stood with his elbow on the saddle, plunged in thought. The young shepherd took no notice of him. He still lay gazing at the sky while the old man slowly looked the overseer up and down and then asked, Why aren't you Pantili from Makarov's estate? That's myself, answered the overseer. To be sure, I see it is. I didn't know you. That is a sign you will be rich. Where has God brought you from? From the Kovilevsky fields. That's a good way. Are you getting the land on the part crop system? Part of it. Some like that. And some we are letting on lease. And some for raising melons and cucumbers. I have just come from the mill. A big shaggy old sheepdog of a dirty white color with woolly tufts about its nose and eyes walked three times quietly round the horse, trying to seem unconcerned in the presence of strangers, then all at once dashed suddenly from behind at the overseer with an angry aged growl. The other dogs could not refrain from leaping up too. Lie down, you damned brute, cried the old man raising himself on his elbow. Blast you, you devil's creature! When the dogs were quiet again, the old man resumed his former attitude and said quietly, It was at Kovili on Ascension Day that Yefim Zemenya died. Don't speak of it in the dark. It is a sin to mention such people. He was a wicked old man. I dare say you have heard. No, I haven't. Yefim Zmenya, the uncle of Stayopka, the blacksmith, the whole district round knew him. Aye, he was a cursed old man, he was. I knew him for sixty years, ever since Tsar Alexander, who beat the French, was brought home, was brought from Taganrog to Moscow. To Moscow. We went together to meet the dead Tsar. And in those days, the great highway did not run to Bamut, but from Asolvka to Gorodishch, and where 
Tovili is now, there were bust, bustards nests. There was a bustard's nest at every step. Even then I had noticed that Yefim had given his soul to damnation, and that the evil one was in him. I have observed that if any man of the peasant class is apt to be silent, takes up with old women's jobs, and tries to live in solitude, there is no good in it, and Yefim from his youth up was always one to hold his tongue and look at you sideways. He always seemed to be sulky and bristling like a cock before a hen. To go to church or to the tavern or to lark in the street with the lads was not his fashion. He would rather sit alone or be whispering with old women. When he was still young, he took jobs to look after the bees and the market gardens. Good folks would come to his market garden sometimes and his melons were whistling. One day he caught a pike when folks were looking on and it laughed aloud. Ho, 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 ho. It, it does happen, said Pantili. The young shepherd turned on his side and lifting his black eyebrows stared intently at the old man. Did you hear the melons whistling? He asked. Hear them I didn't. The Lord spared me, sighed the old man. But folks told me so. It is no great wonder. The evil one will begin whistling in a stone if he wants to. Before the day of freedom, a rock was humming for three days and three nights in our parts. I heard it myself. The pike laughed because Yefim caught a devil inside of a pike. The old man remembered something. He got up quickly on his knees and, shrinking as though from the cold, nervously thrusting his hands into his sleeves, he muttered a rapid womanish gabble. Lord save us and have mercy upon us. I was walking along the river bank one day to Nova Pavlovka. A storm was gathering, such a tempest it was. Preserve us, Holy Mother, Queen of Heaven. I was hurrying on as best I could. I looked, and beside the path, the thorn bushes. The thorn was in flower at the time. There was a white bullock coming along. I wondered whose bullock it was and what the devil had sent it there for. It was coming along, swinging its tail, and moo, oo, oo, and would you believe it, friends, I overtake it, I come up close, and it's not a bullock, but Yefim, holy, 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 I make the sign of the cross while he stares at me and mutters, showing the whites of his eyes, wasn't I frightened? We came alongside, I was afraid to say a word to him, the thunder was crashing, the sky was streaked with lightning, the willows were bent right before, right down to the water. All at once, my friends, God strike me dead that I die impenitent, impenitent. A hare ran across the path. It ran and stopped and said like a man, Good evening, peasants. Lie down, you brute, the old man cried to the shaggy dog who was moving round the horse again. Plague take you. It does happen, said the overseer still leaning on the saddle and not stirring. He said this in the hollow, toneless voice in which men speak when they are plunged in thought. It does happen, he repeated in a tone of profundity and conviction. Ugh, he was a nasty old fellow, the old shepherd went on with somewhat less fervor. Five years after the freedom, he was flogged by the commune at the office. So to show his spite, he took and sent the throat illness upon all Kov Kovili. Folks died out of numbers, lots and lots of them, just as in cholera. cholera. How did he send the illness? asked the young shepherd after a brief silence. We all know how. There is no great cleverness needed where there is a will to do it. To it. Yefim murdered people with viper's fat. That is such a poison that folks will die from the mere smell of it, let alone the fat. That's true, Pantili agreed. The lads wanted to kill him at the time, but the old people would not let them. It would never have done to kill him. He knew the place where the treasure is hidden, and not another soul did know. The treasures about here are charmed so that you may find them and not see them, but he did see them. At times he would walk along the river bank in the, or in the forest, and under the bushes, 
and under the rocks there would be little flames, little flames, little flames as though from brimstone. I have seen them myself. Everyone expected that Yefim would show people the places or dig the treasure up himself, but he, as the saying is, like a dog in the manger, so he died without digging it up himself or showing other people. The overseer little pipe, and for an instant lighted up his big mustaches and his sharp, stern-looking and dignified nose. Little circles of light danced from his hands to his cap, raced over the saddle along the horse's back, and vanished in its mane near its ears. There are lots of hidden treasures in these parts, he said. And slowly, stretching, he looked round him, resting his eyes on the widening east, and added, There must be treasures. To be sure, sighed the old man, one can see from every sign there are treasures. Only there is no one to dig them, brother. No one knows the real places. Besides, nowadays, you must remember, all the treasures are under a charm. To find them and see them, you must have a ta talisman. And without a talisman, you can do nothing, lad. Yefim had, talism had talismans, but there was no getting anything out of him, the bald devil. He kept them so that no one could get them. The young shepherd crept two paces nearer to the old man and, propping his head on his fists, fastened his fixed stare upon him. A childish expression of terror and curiosity gleamed in his dark eyes and seemed in the twilight to stretch and flatten out the large features of his coarse young face. He was listening intently. It is even written in the scriptures that there are lots of treasures hidden here, the old man went on. It is so for sure, and no mistake about it, an old soldier of Novopovlovka was shown at Ivanovka a writing, and this writing it was printed about the place of the treasure, and even how many pounds of gold was it in it, and the sort of vessel it was in. They would never have found the treasures long ago by that writing. Only the treasure is under a spell. You can't get at it. Why can't you get at it, Grandfather? asked the young man. I suppose there is some reason, the soldier didn't say. It is under a spell. You need a talisman. The old man spoke with warmth, as though he were pouring out his soul before the overseer. He talked the through his nose and being unaccustomed to talk much and rapidly stuttered and conscious of his defects he tried to adorn his speech with gesticulations of the hands and head and thin shoulders and at every movement his hempen shirt crumpled into folds slipped upwards and displayed his back black with age and sunburn he kept pulling it down but it slipped up again at once at last, as though driven out all of all patience by the rebellious shirt, the old man leaped up and said bitterly, bitterly, There is fortune, but what is the good of it if it is buried in the earth? It is just riches wasted with no profit to anyone, like chaff for sheep's dung. And yet there are riches there, lad, fortune enough for all the country round, but not a soul sees it. It will come to this, that the gentry will dig it up, or the government will take it away. The gentry have been begun digging the barrows. They scented something. They are envious of the peasant's luck. The government, too, is looking after itself. It is written in the law that if any peasant finds the treasure, he is to take it to the authorities. I dare say, wait till you get it. There is a brew, but not for you. There is a brew, but not for you. The old man laughed contemptuously and sat down on the ground. The overseer listened with attention and agreed, but from his silence and the expression of his figure, it was evident that what the old man told him was not new to him, and that he had thought it all over long ago, and knew much more than was known to the old shepherd. In my day, I must own, 
I did seek for fortune a dozen times, said the old man, scratching himself nervously. I looked in the right places, but I must have come on treasures under a charm. My father looked for it too, and my brother too, but not a thing did they find, so they died without luck. A monk revealed to my brother Elia, the kingdom of heaven be his, that in one place in the fortress of Taganrog, there was a treasure under three stones, and that treasure was under a charm. And in those days, it was, I remember, in the year 38, an Armenian used to live at Maltsviev Barrow, who sold tal talismans. Ilya bought a talisman, took two other fellows with him, and went to Taganrog. Only when he got to the place in the fortress, brother, there was a soldier with a gun, standing at the very spot. The sound suddenly broke on the still air and floated in all directions over the step. Something in the distance gave a menacing bang, crashed against the stone, and raced over the step, uttering, Ta, 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 ta. When the sound had died away, the old man looked inquiringly at Pantili, who stood motionless and unconcerned. It's a bucket broken away at the pits, said the young shepherd after a moment's thought. It was by now getting light. The Milky Way had turned pale and gradually melted the snow, losing its outlines. The sky was becoming dull and dingy, so that you could not make out whether it was clear or covered thickly with clouds, and only from the bright leaden streak in the east and from the stars that lingered here and there could one tell what was coming. The first noiseless breeze of the morning, cautiously stirring the spurges and the brown stalks of last year's grass, fluttered along the road. The overseer roused himself from his thoughts and tossed his head. With both hands he shook the saddle, touched the girth, and, as though he could not make up his mind to mount the horse, stood still again, hesitating. Yes, he said, your elbow is near, but you can't bite it. There is fortune, but there is not the wit to find it. And he turned facing the shepherds. His stern face looked sad and mocking, as though he were a disappointed man. Yes, so one dies without knowing what happiness is like, he said emphatically, lifting his leg into the stirrup. A younger man may live to see it, but it is time for us to lay aside all thought of it. Stroking his long mustaches covered with dew, he seated, him, he seated himself heavily on the horse and screwed up his eyes, looking into the distance as though he had forgotten something or left something unsaid. In the bluish distance, where the furthest visible hillock melted into the mist, nothing was stirring. The ancient bar barrows, once watched mounds and tombs, which rose here and there above the horizon and the boundless steppe, had a sullen and death-like look. There was a feeling of endless time and utter indifference to man in their immobility and silence. Another thousand years would pass, myriads of men would die, while they would still stand as they had stood with no regret for the dead, nor interest in the living, and no soul would ever know why they stood there, and what secret of the steps was hidden under them. The rooks awakening flew one another in silence over the earth. No meeting was to be seen in the languid flight of those long-lived birds, nor in the morning which repeated punctually every twenty-four hours, nor in the boundless expanse of the steppe. The overseer smiled and said, What space, Lord, have mercy upon us. You would have to hunt to find treasure in it. Here, he went on, dropping his voice and making a serious face. Here, there are two treasures buried for a certainty. The gentry don't know of them, but the old peasants, particularly the, old, the soldiers, know all about them. Here, somewhere on that ridge, the overseer pointed with his whip, Robbers one time attacked a caravan of gold. The gold was being taken from Petersburg to the Emperor Peter, who was building a fleet at the time uh, at 
Verona, Verona, Verones. The robbers killed the men with the caravan and buried the gold, but did not find it again afterwards. Another treasure was buried by our Cossacks of the Don. In the year 12, they carried off lots of plunder of all sorts from the French, goods and gold and silver. When they were going homewards, they heard on the way that the government wanted to take away all the gold and silver from them. Rather than give up their plunder like that to the government for nothing, the brave fellows took and buried it so that their children, anyway, might get it. But where they buried it, no one knows. I have heard of those treasures, the old man muttered grimly. Yes, Pantili pondered again. So it is. A silence followed. The overseer looked dreamily into the distance, gave a laugh and pulled the rein, still with the same expression as though he had forgotten something or left something unsaid. The horse reluctantly started at a walking pace. After riding a hundred paces, Pantili shook his head resolutely, roused himself from his thoughts, and lashing his horse, set off at a trot. The shepherds were left alone. That was Pantili from Makarov's estate, said the old man. He gets a hundred and fifty a year, and provisions found, too. He is a man of education. The sheep, waking up, there were about three thousand of them, began without zest to while away the time, nipping at the low, half-trampled grass. The sun had not yet risen, but by now all the barrows could be seen, and like a cloud in the distance, soars grave with its peaked top. If one clambered up on that tomb, one could see the plain from it, level and boundless as the sky. One could see villages, manor houses, the settlements of the Germans and of the Molokani, and a long-sighted Kalmuk could even see the town and the railway station. Only from there could one see that there was something else in the world besides the silent steppe and the, and the ancient barrows, that there was another life that had nothing to do with buried treasure and the thoughts of sheep. The old man felt beside him for his crook, a long stick with a hook at the upper left, upper end, and got up. He was silent and thoughtful. The young shepherd's face had not lost the lost look of childish terror and curiosity. He was still under the influence of what he had heard in the night, and impatiently awaiting fresh stories. Grandfather, he asked, getting up and taking his crook. What did your brother Ilya do with the soldier? The old man did not hear the question. He, look, he looked absent-mindedly at the young man and answered, mumbling with his lips. I keep thinking, Sanka, about that writing that was shown to that soldier at Ivanovka. I didn't tell Pantili, God be with him, but you know, in that writing the place was marked out so that even a woman could find it. Do you know where it is? At Bogata Bailachka, at the spot, you know where the ravine parts like a goose's foot into three little ravines. It is the middle one. Well, will you dig? I will try my luck. And grandfather, what will you do with the treasure when you find it? Do with it, laughed the old man. Hmm. If only I could find it then, I would show them all. Hmm. I show them. I should know what to do. And the old man could not answer what he would do with the treasure if he found it. That question had presented itself to him that morning, probably for the first time in his life, and judging from the expression of his face, indifferent and uncritical, it did not seem to him important and deserving of consideration. In Sanka's brain, another puzzled question was stirring. Why was it only old men searched for hidden treasure? And what was the use of earthly happiness to people who might die any day of old age? But Sanka could not put his perplexity into words, and the old man could scarcely have found an answer to it. An immense crimson sun came into view 
surrounded by a faint haze, broad streaks of light still cold, bathing in the dewy grass, lengthening out with a joyous air as though to prove they were not weary of their task, began spreading over the earth. The silvery wormwood, the blue flowers of the pig's onion, the yellow mustard, the corn flowers, all bur burst into gay colors, taking the sunlight for their own smile. Taking the sunlight for their own smile. The old shepherd and Sanka parted and stood at the further sides of the flock. Both stood like posts, without moving, staring at the ground and thinking. The former was haunted by thoughts of fortune. The latter was pondering on what had been said in the night. What interested him was not the fortune itself, which he did not want and could not imagine, but the fantastic fairy tale character of human happiness. A hundred sheep started and, in some inexplicable panic and at a signal, dashed away from the flock, and as though the thoughts of the sheep, tedious and oppressive, had for a moment infected Sanka also, he too dashed aside in the same inexplicable animal panic, but at once he recovered himself and shouted, You crazy creatures, you've gone mad, plague take you! When the sun, promising long hours of overwhelming heat, began to bake the earth, all living things that in the night had moved and uttered sounds were sunk in drowsiness. The old shepherd and Sanka stood with their crooks on opposite sides of the flock, stood without stirring, like fakirs at their prayers, absorbed in thought. They did not heed each other, each of them was living his own life. The sheep were pondering, too. Barrow. Barrow is a wheelbarrow or a luggage trolley or a handcart. 